The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Oh, what has happened to the Baltimore Orioles? My goodness. The Yankees, by the way, clinched last night. They won at Seattle, so they are in the playoffs. The Orioles are doing everything they can to play themselves out of it. Another loss last night. Going to try and salvage one game from the three-game series against the Giants this afternoon. We got coverage of that coming up at 1230. That's a mess. <laughs> Nationals, oh yeah, yeah. Last two nights in New York, they lost by a combined score of 20 to 1. They're on to Chicago tonight to play the Cubs. A lot of football, obviously, to talk about, although it's been kind of quiet this week with the Commanders because they adjusted the schedule for the Monday night game. But uh, yesterday, Dan Quinn was on the Rich Eisen show, and we'll play some of what he said about developing the young quarterback in Jaden Daniels and uh, what he said particularly about him sliding. Uh, we'll get to that and a lot more in the 10 o'clock hour. I want to spend some time here on uh, Kirk Cousins in this hour and a few other things. There's uh, also some Dion news to talk about, which we will get to. But uh, I, I want to begin with this, and it's something that we talked about yesterday. And uh, I don't know if the commanders can satisfy what uh, the people of Montana, when I say people, the uh, senator, Steve Daines, the Republican senator from Montana once, along with the William Blackhorse family, which uh, designed the logo uh, that they had on the helmets and, uh, and used for other things from, what, 1972 to 2020. So a long, long time. And um, if you're not familiar with this, and this is how complicated it gets, Barry Zverluga wrote a really good column about this today and, and attack Steve Daines for what he's doing and question the family as to what they want because they seem to be moving the goalposts every time. Uh, this couple of paragraphs, though, really summarizes what a crazy mess this is. Barry writes, a family from Montana whose forefather designed the out-of-use logo for an NFL franchise with a now-defunct name feels disrespected by that franchise, which has just opened up a memorial honoring that forefather's constitution contribution in hopes of assuaging family members through a senator from their home state continues to block a bill that would allow the use of the land within the District of Columbia borders, which might well be used to develop the new stadium. Yeah, you got all that. That's how complicated it is. And we went through all this stuff yesterday um, that uh, the family of the man that designed the logo, 1972, remember they had worn those, I thought, silly-looking yellow helmets for a couple of years with the R and the feather hanging off the circle of the R. And uh, in 1972, they came up with this uh, with this logo, which was designed by a, a, a Native American. And, you know, it was accepted for a long, long time. They had their greatest success with that logo, going to four Super Bowls over a nine-year period and winning three of them. But now we got a situation where the commanders would at least like to have the opportunity to explore going to the RFK site to build the new stadium. And it's essentially being blocked by this Montana Senator, Steve Daines, who is saying, well, you, you got to satisfy the family here uh, before we do that. And, you know, what you've seen is it looks like they've done that. I haven't seen it up close, but I've seen the pictures. There is a very nice display inside what is now Northwest Stadium. It used to be FedEx Field. Got to get used to saying Northwest Stadium. And it shows the old logo and uh, I think is a very nice uh, tribute to Blackie Wetzel, who designed the logo all those years ago. Uh, but the family is saying, well, we don't know if it's quite enough. They've even sent an emissary there to, to talk to him. Uh, Jason Wright, the outgoing team president, uh, apparently well received by the family. They had representatives from or a representative from the league going to see them as well. And they're still not satisfied. And meantime, you have this senator from Montana, Steve Dane, say, well, you know, until you satisfy the family, uh, I'm not going to vote in favor of the RFK Stadium bill, which if you're not familiar with it, it would allow for development of commercial property around the stadium site, which is not the way it works now. Uh, this is uh, federal land, which RFK sits on, and it's the carcass is still up. They ripped everything out of it. I don't know why they don't tear the damn thing down, but uh, I guess they're waiting to decide what they're going to do with the land. 
And so uh, what the, the new bill would do would extend the lease 99 years and would change the terms of it to make it possible to build the stadium there. But all it takes is one vote in the Senate against the bill, and that's it. And that's what that's what's happening here now. Um, and what Barry is saying, hey, here's a guy in Montana who's telling people what to do with the land in the District of Columbia, and you also have him carrying water for this uh, tribe or for the, the de- descendants of Blackie Wetzel, uh, and they keep saying, well, okay, yeah, this is what we want, but, oh, no, that's not good enough. And, uh, and, and it's like, you know, when is this dam going to break here? And if it doesn't, that means another year where this is in doubt, the bill gets reintroduced. Uh, it's another year where the possibility of a stadium in the District of Columbia gets pushed ahead, and we don't know if it's ever going to happen, which is why there are some who believe, hell, you know, they'll just say the hell with it, and they already own the land where the current stadium sits. They would build a new one closer to the Morgan Boulevard metro station and just go from there. I mean, dealing with the District of Columbia has never been an easy thing, but that's not really the problem here. This is a this is a Montana senator who once said, this is a quote that Barry has from him, we do not need bureaucrats back in Washington telling us how to protect our lands in Montana. Well, you might want to flip that around. We don't need a senator in Montana telling us what to do with our land in the District of Columbia, where it, it, it would appear, I guess if you did surveys, it would appear that most people would like to have the stadium built back there and uh, relive the days when it was easy to get to, very convenient, right off the metro, and easy to drive to, easy to get in and out of, and uh, and people loved it. And, you know, one of the things about that was talked about in, in past years as they were building stadiums uh, larger and larger was, well, you know, it's a quaint notion that people could go to RFK Stadium when it's at 55,000 people, and they could get in and out pretty easily. But, you know, now they're building stadiums 80,000. That might not be uh, likely. Well, guess what? Things have changed, and television has changed a lot. So the plans would be for a 60,000-seat stadium. Uh, and they've gotten away from the idea that if you're going to have a Super Bowl, it's got to be in an 80,000-seat-plus stadium. The the game last year, this year, I guess, was held in Vegas, and attendance was 61,000. So that's that's not that's not going to be an issue here. Uh, And it would make total sense for, I think, a lot of us to see the stadium back on the RFK site. But here it is. Two things that are holding it up. The family of Walter Blackie Wetzel and a senator from Montana who's backing them and, and using an issue which I don't think is that important to the people of Montana. You're supposed to represent your constituency. And, and I don't think this is a hot button issue for the people in Montana whether the family of Walter Blackie Wetzel uh, gets proper recognition for designing the logo. And the Wetzel family is not looking for them to change the name back to Redskins. And I, I don't think, although I guess it could be possible, that you could bring the logo back and call them something else. Maybe you could bring, I, I, I think this is a long shot, but it might be possible to bring the logo back and then call them the Washington football team, which is what I felt Right from the beginning, uh, this this nonsense about commanders and the stupid rollout that they had of it, uh, just a sloppy mess. Stay with the Washington football team. And those of us who remember them as the Redskins will think of that in our minds. And those who are newer to the team, well, get used to saying Washington football team. It's OK. It, 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 it could work. And I think Tony Kornheiser crystallized this a couple of years ago. He said, uh, there will never be a name that will satisfy the fan base. So why not just go with Washington football team and stay with that? And I agree. I think that's that's the way to go. All right, uh, Kirk Cousins. <laughs> it's funny how one play can change the trajectory of everything, at least for a while. And if on Monday night Saquon Barkley holds on to a third down pass, doesn't drop it, The Eagles win that game. They're able to bleed out the clock, kick the field goal, game's over. But he dropped the pass. They had to kick the field goal. There's a minute and 45 seconds left to go. And what do you know? Kirk Cousins, who would have been buried at that point because he would be 0-2, and people would say, well, that $180 million contract, what a waste of money. He wasn't good in game one against the Steelers, and he was just okay in this game on Monday night in Philadelphia 
But given the opportunity that he was given with the Saquon Barkley drop, he takes the team down the field, completed five of six passes for 70 yards and capped it off with a seven-yard touchdown pass to Drake London with 34 seconds left that gave the Falcons a 22-21 win. And uh, I just picked up uh, an AP story where the headline, it's a story by Paul Newberry, and the headline on the story is Cousins Suddenly Looks Worthy of $180 million quarterback contract. Right? I mean, Saquon holds on. (laughs) Kirk Cousins, disaster. Waste of money. Barkley drops the pass. Cousins takes him down the field. They win the game. Different outlook. Cousins yesterday on the Dan Patrick show asked about the last drive that the Eagles had with the chance to salt away the game and asked what he was thinking. The final drive of the game, uh, I've got some scars in my football career uh, where I thought we had won the game and then it didn't end up uh, the way I had hoped. So I get a little skeptical uh, when I'm standing there watching, but uh, you also believe, you know, we can do this. And um, uh, all the Eagles needed was a field goal. So I was just standing and watching and, um, and our defense made a great play. Jesse Bates was instinctual, got the interception, and at that point just needed to take a knee. But when you see them passing, because I, on the Manning cast, you had Peyton Eli and Matt Ryan saying the only way the Falcons can get the ball back is if the Eagles put the ball in the air. You see the pass, and then what are you thinking when Saquon drops that? You know, I think that's what's kind of so fun about pro football is the strategy and the different options you have there. I had heard an argument for – you do the the you know the sneak that they've made famous on third down and see if you can get it to a fourth and one and then because that play is seemingly so unstoppable just do it again on fourth down and believe that you're going to get it again so there's an argument for just doing that sneak all the way down the field um but the play was a good play in the sense that he 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 is open in the flat and it's a safe throw and uh your odds are he's going to catch it and potentially convert and and you can ice the game so you know, when you don't know the future, you don't know how it's going to play out. All you can do is is make your best call that you believe in and um, and let it go from there. What was it like? You get in the huddle for that last drive and you say what? You know, I get very methodical. I'm kind of just process driven. So the play comes in. Hey, we got to run this play. Uh, if anything, it's all game. It's, hey, guys, let's just have fun competing and, and let wait, the outcome. Wait, wait, wait. That's what you say? You're just like, hey, let's let's compete. Have some fun. I think there's a little bit of that. Just let's not overcomplicate this. We don't need to talk about, uh, you know, the magnitude of the moment. We don't need to talk about how John Candy's in the stands. You know, they talk about how Joe Montana said that. Like, <laughs> hey, that's all well and good, but let's just go play and uh, find the open guy, um, get rid of the ball, and try to get that first first down. And I think I play my best just kind of simplifying the process and just treat it like you're, you're playing the job, your position you've always played. I, I'm going to give your offensive line credit, but also in the process question, the Eagles didn't blitz you. How surprised yeah. were you? And I know their defensive coordinator normally doesn't do that, but I, you don't have great mobility coming off surgery. How surprised were you that they didn't send an extra guy or two? Well, so the touchdown of Darnell Mooney was cover zero. So that was an all out blitz. So if anything, okay. you know, when they did when they did bring the blitz, you know, we had a, our biggest play of the night in terms of an explosive play. So he may have said, hey, I, I learned my lesson sending the pressure there. Let's not do that. And secondly, until the final drive, when they were playing more of a prevent coverage to just keep us out of the end zone, they really did have a roof on the defense and we were, weren't getting many explosives throughout the game. So I would say their plan was reasonably effective um, outside of that cover zero and then outside of the final drive. So I wouldn't really second guess that plan. And Vic Fangio is a D coordinator. I have a lot of respect for played against a lot. He's always kind of been tough. It's been hard to find explosives. And in the first game against the Packers, they didn't blitz a ton either. So it was pretty, pretty consistent with what they've been doing. That's uh, Kirk Cousins on the Dan Patrick show on his final drive to beat Philadelphia. The other night, uh, it's been a tale of two games, obviously, for him this season. Not a good performance in week one against the Steelers. And the ability to shake that off and come back and play like he did on Monday night, uh, this is what he discussed as well with Dan Patrick. Honestly, Dan, that's the challenge I've had my whole career is how do you – how do you still sort of sleep at night? How do you – you know, because you're going to fail. This league's going to test you. Is being able to kind of – let it roll off your back and just move forward. For me, it's always been you just wear it so hard. And uh, that was something that both Sean McVay and I used to kind of 
you know, have a kindred spirit about is it just, it just eats at you. And it's what, it's what makes you great. It's one of your greatest strengths, but then it can also be one of your biggest challenges you face. And, um, and just that, that how much it means to you is something I've always tried to kind of balance. <laughs> but the pressure that I see on these rookie quarterbacks, you played, I think one game, your rookie season, but you know, high draft pick, come on in and let's see some magic here. Uh, Bryce Young from last year. Now he gets benched. I, can you, can you put us in that position of what that pressure is like for these kids? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's difficult. Um, first of all, football's a team game. And so when you have a great system, great coaches around you, getting people wide open, the protection plan's outstanding, you're going to look a little better and vice versa when you, you know, if you got a, you know, people around you who aren't really helping move the needle, that can make it a lot harder too. So, um, the quarterback gets evaluated so much as if he's on an island when in reality it's a team deal. And then uh, certainly as a rookie, there's going to be, you know, a learning curve. There's going to be things that you've got to figure out. And then, then year two comes where defenses say, okay, we, we've got a year of film on you now. We're going to study you and start to figure out better how to defend you. So even once you have a good rookie year, that doesn't suddenly mean you've got it all figured out. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. I learned that firsthand being a fourth round pick, thinking that going to Washington was a dead end and seeing how my career played out. You, you got to play for the long game and just believe that if you have good habits and a good process, that the long game will work itself out. You got the Chiefs coming to town? Yep, Sunday night. How how often do you you watch the other quarterback? To Not, not as a fan, but just watching – during the game of what Mahomes would do or Brady would do or Josh, whoever it might be? Well, it's funny because I remember driving home from a game last year. Uh, we play at noon in Minnesota, Central Time. So we'd be driving home at like 4 o'clock. And my wife, who, who loves following it all, said in the car, she said, oh, Sunday Night Football this week is uh, Mahomes versus versus Stafford. That's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun or, or whatever the two quarterbacks were. And I remember kind of kind of laughed. I'm like, well, it's the Chiefs versus the Rams. It's not Mahomes <laughs> versus Stafford. But but her point is, is that the quarterbacks are what makes it fun to watch. And, and I would tend to agree with her that when you have two really high-level, experienced quarterbacks with a lot of skins on the wall, that's what kind of draws my interest the most to watch and to study and to see. And so um, I think that's where football gets really fun is when you get those quarterbacks who you feel really know what they're doing. Um, it, it's it's really the best product. Kirk Cousins on the Dan Patrick Show. He's talking about quarterback matchups. How about this week? Joe Burrow, Heisman Trophy winner from LSU, had transferred from another school to get to LSU. Jaden Daniels, Heisman Trophy winner from LSU, transferred from another school to get to LSU. And they'll match up on Monday Night Football. We'll get into that in the next hour. A lot, a lot of discussion about that. But uh, you heard Cousins mention Sean McVay. Cousins and McVay, two, a quarterback and a coach who both got out of D.C. and had some success. <laughs> Part of the legacy of Mike Shanahan and what he brought here and what was destroyed by ridiculously bad ownership and bad management. Uh, we had the other day... On the uh, Adam Schefter podcast, Mike Shanahan talking about that and talking about what he was able to put together and uh, how his uh, assistants now populate the league and are having great success. We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. So when do you hear what Deion Sanders has come up with lately? We'll get to that in about 20 minutes. Uh, meantime, uh, if you're just jumping in your car with some... Uh, some conversation between Dan Patrick and Kirk Cousins yesterday on his show as, uh, as Cousins is now looking like a really good find for the Atlanta Falcons, thanks to that last drive on Monday night against the Philadelphia Eagles. But in, in talking to Dan, he mentioned Sean McVay. And, um, well, if you know the history of uh, the Mike Shanahan coaching staff, it's, it's really remarkable uh, what his coaching tree has brought in the NFL and all of these guys came through Washington. Uh, none of them became head coaches here, but are doing quite well. Thank you around the NFL, including cousins coach Raheem Morris, who worked here on the defensive staff under Shanahan. Then you have Sean McVay, who's been to two Super Bowls and won one with the Rams, uh, Mike McDaniel, who's done a, a really good job in Miami and, uh, and was uh, you know, a, a guy who was not even noticed on this staff, 
uh, Matt LaFleur, who's with the Green Bay Packers, Kevin O'Connell, who's with the Minnesota Vikings, and, of course, the son of Mike Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan, who's been to two Super Bowls with the San Francisco 49ers. And all of these guys were here. Hey, yeah, Kirk Cousins was here, too. And you can argue back and forth whether Cousins would have been worth paying franchise quarterback money, and he's certainly cashed in in other places thanks to the mismanagement here. But it would have been better than what they've had going through quarterback after quarterback after quarterback. You could argue now they're in better shape at quarterback long-term with Jaden Daniels than Atlanta is with Cousins. But uh, there's no denying that the chaos that's been going on here for a long time, not all of it their fault. I mean, Alex Smith, if he stays healthy, who knows how good he would have been for the next, you know, three, four, five years, whatever. But considering what Dan Snyder had here and the way he just, completely undermine Mike Shanahan and later the staff with the Robert Griffin mess. It's just remarkable. So again, look at the coaches around the league, Raheem Morris, Atlanta, Sean McVay, Los Angeles, Mike McDaniel, Miami, LaFleur, Matt LaFleur in Green Bay, Kevin O'Connell in Minnesota, and of course, Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco, who joined Mike as the offensive coordinator when Shanahan was hired here in 2010 against the wishes of the old man. I told him I didn't think it was very smart for him to go with me because they're going to call it nepotism unless we really do something special. I said, hey, we're at least two years away before we have a chance of you know winning a game, so my recommendation to him would, was to not go with me, to go to a team that had better personnel than we had at that time. When you take a look at the personnel that we had and the records that we had, I mean, total offense, total defense, all the things you look for when you're going to be a head coach in the National Football League and told you that Washington was going to take, take a while. I said, I don't know if you have the patience for it, but I said, he said, there's no way. He said, I'm coming if you'll take me. And so. I said, well, I'm not sure it's you're doing the right thing, but if you want to go, let's do it together. So you recommended to Kyle Shanahan that he not come with you to Washington, but he did anyway. Yeah. yeah. And and when you look back on that experience, how meaningful was it to get to work on a day-to-day basis with your son? It was so really good for me because, you know, anytime you get in your 60s, you get a little tired. I mean, you're looking at film. You're, you're there early in the morning. You're leaving late at night. And then you've got these young coaches that, man, they're up early. They're staying late. And we're talking about doing different things on offense. Every year you have to change things. You've got to keep up on the game. If you don't keep on the, up on the game, it passes you by. And they did such a great job of studying different colleges, different pro teams. And when you're evaluating, uh, might be a college player, it might be a pro coach, they'd come up with different things that other teams were doing that you'd say, oh, my God, that's what a great idea. Let's look at this in the offseason and see if we want to make this part of our package. And that went all the way from different personnel groups to, you know, different formations, you know, different motions and different things that you've done throughout your career. But I had four or five of those coaches that, I mean, they were gung-ho and they were they were on the top of their game and made it, made it a lot easier for me. Well, you know what's interesting is you brought up the word nepotism. And when you got fired in Washington, and everybody got fired with you. People criticized the staff. They said nepotism was involved and everybody went their own way. When you got fired there and you haven't coached since then, uh, are you surprised or did you know that all this greatness lay ahead for this Washington staff that's become something of a joke nationally that Washington got rid of all these people all at once who all went on to become great coaches in their own respective places. Well, to be honest with you, we went into the third year. We had to put a different system in. You know, Robert Griffin was our quarterback. And, you know, you deal with the quarterback. You're going through, you know, your spring balls. And we knew we were going to have to do some things that were a little, a little different than we've ever done before. And I told the quarter, I told the coaches, I said, man, you guys are going to have to put up with something because we got to do what Robert does best. So when we put in that type of offense and we were able to go to the playoffs, uh, it made me feel good about our whole coaching staff because we were doing things that Robert could do. And unfortunately, we lost a tough game in Dallas in the playoffs. But I knew at that time uh, that our coaches were on top of what they were doing because they did some things that had never been done before in the pro game. And I know you're not on social media much, but you probably don't see it much. 
But that constantly comes up the group coaching headshot of all the guys on your staff in Washington who were all criticized, you know, part of nepotism, all let go all at once, all who went on to greatness elsewhere. Are you aware of the fact that it's become something of a national joke that comes up there, that famous Washington assistant coaching staff that you put together? I think one thing you always do as a head coach, you always follow the people that have either played for you or coached for you. And so I followed their careers right from the beginning. So you know how much success they have. And you know the guys that maybe didn't have as much success, but they go on, they they don't give up. They keep on working because they know the details that it takes to get that opportunity. And a lot of guys don't do it the first round. But sometimes guys will do it the second round. So it's been fun to watch. Mike Shanahan on the Adam Schefter uh, podcast. Uh, just in case you need the role called once again, why not? Sean McVay head coach of the Rams, two Super Bowl appearances, one Super Bowl championship. Mike McDaniel, coach of the Miami Dolphins, had them in the playoffs last year. Raheem Morris, head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. Matt LaFleur, head coach of the Packers. They won a big playoff game in Dallas last year. Kevin O'Connell, head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. And, of course, Kyle Shanahan, who has been to two Super Bowls with the San Francisco 49ers. All of them in Washington all of them now in other places having varied degrees of success, all falling off the Mike Shanahan tree. I'm not sure why Shanahan, though, said there uh, about the playoff game with Griffin that they lost in Dallas. Uh, they actually beat Dallas at the end of the 2012 season to win the division. That was like a winner-take-all game on a Sunday night, and they won. Alfred Morris was really the key there where he ran for 200 yards. But uh, the tough playoff game was at home against Seattle, and to this day you can get people fired up about whether or not Griffin should have been taken out of that game. I thought he should have. Uh, when it was 14 nothing. I thought he should have come out, and I thought Kirk Cousins could have won it, but uh, that didn't happen. He stayed in the game, and then the knee completely blew out at the end of the game. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just – It's just head shaking. Anyway, uh, after Shanahan got fired, then Jay Gruden comes in. And Jay Gruden was brought in to fix Robert Griffin III, which did not happen. I mean, they (laughs) early on, Gruden knew that this wasn't going to work. And and I remember this. This was the 2014 season. So Shanahan, after that remarkable year in 2012, where they get to the playoffs with Griffin, Griffin has this incredible year. Uh, things just totally collapse in 2013, partially because Griffin didn't want to do what he needed to do to be successful. He decided he was going to be Aaron Rodgers. He wasn't going to run that offense. He also wasn't ready to come back and has now finally admitted he should have sat out that season, but he was too insecure. He was too insecure about Kirk Cousins uh, supplanting him, so he he went all in for week one with a big campaign on Gatorade. And he came back and, uh, you know, the rest is history. And now he's got his nose pressed up against the glass, hoping to get another shot that he's not going to get. Um, Jay Gruden, interesting, he, after he was fired here, he got a shot. uh, I don't even think he was an offensive coordinator. I think it was an offensive assistant, maybe in Jacksonville. And that lasted one year. And he's not even 60 now, but he said, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to coach again. He's trying to launch a media career. He plays a lot of golf. And uh, he says, you know, at this point in his life, he recognizes that his coaching career is over. Now, his brother, John Gruden, I believe is older. I think he's a few years older. Uh, John Gruden also tied to this franchise because I believe this is the case. You you can believe what you want. But uh, the emails that came out, the uh, exchange between he and uh, Bruce Allen, which had uh, misogynistic and, and racist comments in him, uh, that led to him being forced out of the Raiders situation in uh, 2021. Um, and so he has not coached since. Uh, he had a $100 million contract with the Raiders. I, I imagine they settled for a portion of that because he wasn't essentially fired, although he was fired. Uh, it's just they called it a resignation. So I'm sure there was some negotiating there before he left. But now he's 61 years old. Yeah, so he is older than Jay. He's a few years older than Jay. And, uh, and John Gruden... Uh, talked to CBS Sports, and he said he wants to coach again, and he's interested in coaching in college. He's got a YouTube channel called Gruden Loves Football in which he has breakdowns, mostly about NFL teams and matchups, and interviews former and current players. He's already talked to uh, Derek Carr and uh, Drew Brees, and uh, he's uh, he's done, you know, sessions that he's really good at, you know, breaking down film. 
and things like that. But uh, this is what he said about coaching in college. I guess he's he's thrown in the towel on the pros. But he says if there's somebody out there that thinks they need a candidate, somebody to come in there and lather it up a little bit, jazz it up a little bit, I'll be down here in Tampa. I'll be ready to go if needed. Well, you know what's not far from Tampa, relatively speaking? Gainesville. And the University of Florida has a coach named Billy Napier who's going to be fired at the end of the season, if not sooner. And it would seem that that would be a good fit. Could there be backlash from alums and others? Oh, bringing in a guy who uh, had you know racist and misogynistic comments to make on on email exchanges with Bruce Allen. No, no, it's not going to happen because they'll they'll sell their soul for a guy who can win, and he has proven he can win. He won a Super Bowl, Super Bowl the 37, 15 years as an NFL coach. His record is 117 and 112, um, and, uh, and, and he did have some action. Actually, he did have some experience coaching in college. He was the wide receivers coach at Pitt in 1991, also the receivers coach for Pacific in 1989, and the passing game coordinator for Southeast Missouri State in 1988, and a graduate assistant for Tennessee in 1986 and 87. That's going back a ways, so I guess his last, his last experience coaching in, in college was over 30 years ago, but the, the pro game, and this is what you hear too with these, with these rookie quarterbacks, the pro game is, is a lot more similar to what it is in college than it used to be. And part of it is they just don't have the time to develop these quarterbacks now. You, you got to play them. So as, as Mike Shanahan was talking about there with, with Robert Griffin back now, that's 12 years ago. Uh, they realized, hey, we're not going to develop him as a, a pro passer in year one. We got to make some adjustments and uh, and make it more like the college game. And twelve years later, it it really is. And uh, and so I think that he would have a, a pretty good opportunity to develop quarterbacks that would be pro ready uh, at the college level. And uh, and he wins. And he would bring he would bring some excitement to Florida. Would there be some people who say, well, you know, here's what was in the emails and, and we can't have somebody like that? Yeah, that one might last a little while. But what you see across college football is they'll, they'll do anything to win. And that's why you see Urban Meyer's name still thrown around. I don't think he's going to coach again, but if he was interested in doing it, you better believe somebody would hire him. That's just it's, – it's can you win? Can you win? And if you believe that John Gruden can win – you're going to hire him to be a coach, and I would look. I would look closely at the Florida situation. I would not be surprised at all if John Gruden is the head coach at Florida next year. I don't think he would come in as an interim coach this year, but uh, I would. I would expect that uh, that they would have him uh, all lined up by January, and he'd be ready to roll. So we'll see. Uh, coming up, uh, Deion Sanders manipulates the media, and now he's decided to take a tact that has Paul Feinbaum. All fired up. We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. Must qualify for enrollment. Results may vary. We all hear the radio ads about the IRS. They tell you to be afraid, to be scared, and they try to frighten you into calling. I'm not here to do that. Tax Relief Advocates is different. TRA is here to tell you that if you owe money to the IRS, whether it's $5,000, $50,000, or $500,000, we have a solution. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in your car, at work, or with your kids. No matter where you are, call now. 800-575-8695. Don't lose hope. TRA can eliminate or reduce what you owe to the IRS. Generous programs are now available that can give you a fresh start. Our passion is taxes and helping individuals fix their IRS problems. We have over 1,000 five-star reviews on Google and an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. You don't need to be afraid of the IRS any longer. End your tax nightmare today by visiting us online at tra.com or call 800-575-8695. That's 800-575-8695. Tax Relief Advocates. Real solutions for real people. Offer not valid in all states or where prohibited by law. Loans are subject to lender approval. See website for details. Meet Brian. Brian seems pretty typical. Hardworking, lives modestly, but has gotten a little behind with bills. Except Brian just got $5,000 deposited into his bank account. Yep, $5,000, and it was actually quite easy. I'll tell you how Brian did it in 30 seconds. Brian was in need of cash help. After being rejected by banks, family, and friends, he decided to try 79cash.com. He filled out their questionnaire in minutes right from his phone listed how much he needed, and even let them know he had bad credit. 
Almost instantly, 79cash.com found a lender who approved him for $5,000. Brian now has cash to use however he wants, pay bills, rent, or use it for a trip. Best part, the money hit Brian's bank account the very next day. And just like that, Brian no longer needed cash help. If you need cash help for any reason, even if you have bad credit like Brian, go to 79cash.com. That's 79cash.com. More than 45,000 flights and 2.9 million passengers move through the national airspace system each day. And every day, aviation safety professionals represented by the National Air Traffic Controllers Association are on the job, keeping travelers safe. From taxiways to takeoff, en route to landing, NATCA members put safety first. They are the caretakers of the skies, guiding both passenger and cargo air traffic to their destinations safely and efficiently. The National Air Traffic Controllers Association, NATCA, we guide you home. My son Ian was diagnosed with a brain tumor at the age of 16 months. The outlook was pretty rough. I mean, it was, you know, we had no hope until St. Jude rescued us. I mean, they saved him. To this date, you know, we are 12 years into this journey and uh, from day one, we've never once seen a bill. It gave us the peace of mind to know that we're there with our son and we're gonna beat cancer together now he is doing really, really well. He's alive because of what St. Jude has done. He's here because of the doctors who came before, their blood, their sweat, their tears, the knowledge accumulated and shared you know, with everyone else around the world. This is how we get rid of this, how we help kids beat cancer all over. It's the future. Together, we will make cures possible for every child everywhere. Learn more at stjude.org. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. A right, little media yak here. Uh, in the next hour, we'll get to what uh, Dan Quinn said yesterday on the Rich Eisen Show about getting Jaden Daniels to slide. Uh, that is, uh, he is sliding, but uh, the way he's going down on runs, I don't know how sustainable that is. So we've already had one... <gasps> moment you know when he got hit in the ribs and uh you oh my god broken ribs whatever no he missed a play and was uh, just the wind knocked out of him but you know he's still got 15 more of these things to go so uh we'll get to that uh, coming up in the 10 o'clock hour um i i guess i should comment here on uh, what uh, adrian wojnarowski uh, dropped yesterday the ultimate woge bomb i'm out and um it, what i immediately thought of um when when i first heard this was oh my god you know, he's, he's burned out, obviously, and because uh, he's leaving $20 million on the table. How does Adam Schefter continue to do this? Schefter's making more money. Schefter's making $9 million a year. Woj is making $7.5 million a year from ESPN. He's taken a job at his alma mater, St. Bonaventure. He's going to be the general manager for basketball. They, they don't even have football there. So he's going to manage, I guess, the cap or if there is a cap or, or raise lots of money and get the collective. I mean, St. Bonaventure is not exactly the most attractive place to play. You know, it's in upstate New York where it gets bitterly cold in the winter. And, uh, you know, on occasion, they've had teams that uh, that have been really good. Bob Lanier took them to a final four, but that was 1970, you know, to make St. Bonaventure a powerhouse, that's going to be a challenge. But I guess the challenge of continuing to live his life the way he has just was too much. And at 55, he looked down the barrel of, I think he's had, what, four more years left, three more years left on the contract and said, I don't think I can do this. Schefter's been doing it longer. And, and this is not a job. This is a life. This is where you have to have your phone with you 24 hours a day, and as Schefter discussed yesterday, Woj got tired of having the phone with him at the urinal. Uh, when he took a shower, he had to have his phone visible for text messages. Um, everywhere he went, he was tied to the phone all the time. And and frankly, you know, at least for me, I, I like the NBA, but I'm not hanging on every transaction. Sure, you want to know where LeBron is going to move, if he's going to move again, and you know, Anthony Davis, there's, there's some stars that this happens with. But the day-to-day -day stuff from Schefter, I think, is is more compelling to most sports fans, mainly because the NFL is so much more popular. 
But but Woj did what he was paid to do and get it out as quickly as possible. Get it out first. Now, you know, it, it depends on where you when you pick up your phone and you look at your X feed or your 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 Twitter feed, whatever you want to still call it, um, whether he got it out or Sharm Sharania. Woj had a bigger platform because it could be followed up by going on ESPN. And and Sharania is mainly, you know, through text and 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 Twitter and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it, and, and there's been some speculation that, that, that Sharani is going to replace him, but they've already come up with somebody named Rosenberg who's, who's putting out some tweets, but this, this insider stuff, I think it's eventually going to go to the gambling sites because that's, that's a bigger deal for them. And as a matter of fact, Schefter getting 9 million from ESPN, uh, there were reports that he was offered more from one of the, one of the sites, DraftKings may have been, but, uh, he decided to stay and, and Schefter, is more TV oriented, like you saw him if you watch the Monday Night Countdown show. He dressed up in the same Mummers outfit that uh, Jason Kelsey wore when he did his ex- expletive-filled rant at the Super Bowl parade uh, some years ago when the Eagles won it, like five years ago. Um, so, <laughs> you know, he'll he'll do the TV shtick. He's got a podcast. He talks he talks NBA a little bit. You know, he's he's got some other interest, even though he's also tethered to his phone and seems to. Seems to embrace it. You know, he said he has not taken a, a vacation in like 10 years. Uh, he's even gone so far, his son, and it's the son, I, I don't think he adopted him, but, uh, you know, he married, Schefter married a, 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 the widow of a, a 9-11 uh, victim, and she had a young son, and so that's in his family, and then the two of them have, had a daughter together who I guess is like 16 years old. And uh, and so this was a couple years ago, and the son graduated from Michigan on draft weekend and Schefter goes okay that's it phones turned off I'm not going to have any contact with ESPN the graduation takes center stage goes to the graduation Eagles make a big deal and he's tweeting away you know he's got his contacts with the Eagles and whoever whichever team uh, was involved in the deal and and he's off and running he can't can't stay away from it and that's you know that that probably is not a healthy life and I think that that Woj probably realize this but i look at the bigger picture of this and and how much longer can Schefter continue to do this there's going to be others that are going to come up through the ranks and also want to do this but Schefter's value to espn is not that he can get a hold of people quickly it's that he knows so many people who give him information and lead him in the right direction uh and you know even with woge uh, he's he's a, he was a reporter first. He started out as a newspaper reporter, became an insider for Yahoo before ESPN snapped him up and paid him all that money. Um, but he uh, he works more on uh, actual news. He's not a hot take kind of thing, and neither neither is Schefter. But there's more sizzle and splash with Schefter for two reasons: one, the personality, and two, it's the NFL which is of a much wider interest than the NBA, not that people aren't interested in what happens in the NBA. But to think that, you know, he, he's got a contract that still has three years left to go and uh, $20 million on it, and he walked away to take a job. I mean, I'm sure it's a, it's, it's a nice salary. I'm sure it's a six-figure deal, but it, it ain't, it ain't $7.5 million a year. But I think he just realized, oh, my God, this is this is my life. And I don't know how much longer I could live it this way. And uh, and so he got out. But the uh, the 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 grind of this and, you know, you think about media jobs over the years, Um, like, for example, uh, if you saw all the president's men, what Woodward and Bernstein did over, I don't know, was it a year, year and a half? Okay, that's. That's incredible, and it set their lives up in a way that they probably never imagined when they decided to become newspaper reporters, the intensity of, of doing that over that period of time. But they were both young. I think they were both in their 20s, maybe early 30s at the time, and they only did it for that period of time until, well, basically Nixon resigned. So the Watergate break-in was June of 72. Nixon resigned in August of 74. So let's say it was two years two years of intense, intense reporting. Uh, but that's it. I mean, and and then they got into other things. Woodward's written books. He's got a great work ethic. And uh, Bernstein has done other things as well, including television. But the the day-to-day 
continued for two years, but not after that. And that's what Woj was staring down the barrel of, the day-to-day constant, constant. Not that this was anywhere near of the importance of Watergate. Let's not mistake that. But, uh, but I think he looked at his life and said, it's just, there's got to be more to it than that. And, yes, I'm walking away from a lot of money, but I also made a lot of money. And it doesn't appear the way he, he presents himself that he's really interested in a lavish lifestyle. In fact, he's taken a job in only on New York. So think about that. All right, Deion Sanders. Boy, nobody has manipulated the media more than Dion. Made him rich. Neon, Dion, you know, he he's he's a great interview. He's he's fun. Uh, and then he becomes the head coach at Colorado and he decides that, yeah, he's gonna use the media how he wants to use it. And he got himself all, you know, he got multiple interviews with 60 minutes because of how he got people excited about football in Colorado and what he'd done before at Jackson State. But uh, now he just decides that, uh, okay, I'm going to throw this out. And this was, I guess, Monday when he held his news conference about uh, how his kids are being treated by the mean old reporters who he says, get this, are jealous. Once upon a time, you guys never attacked college players. Now they're making more money than y'all. And some of y'all are envious and jealous about that. So you're on the tech. It was hands off a college player because he's an amateur. You remember? Remember that, guys? Now it's hands on. Go at them. Any kind of way you want. They're making more money than me, and I'm mad about it. I'm, I'm upset about it. And when you attack them, attack them, attack them, these guys are sensitive. They've never been attacked. Most of them are out of high school or two years or, or three years uh, in college, but they're still sensitive to, to slander. They hadn't gone through what a grown man, what I've been going through with y'all for years. They haven't done that. So it is what it is. I know you're going to do your job and what you must do, but your job does not say in attack. Like, if they didn't play well, leave it at that. But the personal stuff, leave it to be personal. Because if we start flipping the script on y'all, you wouldn't like it. I can easy. Thank you, Lord, for stopping me there. there. Ooh, that was almost a good one. That would have went viral. Uh, slander, Dion. Slander. OK, if you, if you believe it's slander, then you should tell your players to go to court. It's not slander and jealousy. Ha, anybody who gets into media and is jealous of what other people make, he or she is in the wrong profession. Sure, there are celebrity journalists. Yeah, they're people who who make very good salaries. And Stephen A. Smith, whether you want to consider him in the media or not, I think he's more of an entertainer than anything else at $12 million a year. Okay. But by and large, <laughs> these are these are people who, who found a profession that they love and they're not doing it for money. And, and they're jealous of the college players. Oh, please. This is Paul Feinbaum yesterday on the Dion comments on ESPN. Dion right there was purely gaslighting. Uh, and, and it really unbecoming of somebody of his stature in status. He knows that's not true. Uh, The people that cover college football have been arguing uh, vociferously for years to get more autonomy for players so they can make more money, so they can't be treated the same way that they always have. And and for him to say that is is just really specious. Uh, It's uh, it's baseless. uh, And quite frankly, it it looks to me like he is living in uh, an alternative universe because that is simply not true. And to use the word slander, uh, I mean, that, that is so far beyond the pale because I, most people, the majority of the media uh, lifts these players up. They, they don't tear them down. Quite frankly, the only player on his team that has even come under scrutiny is his son, Shador Sanders. And right here on this program 24 hours ago, the entire panel, Stephen A., myself and Shannon, defended him for not shaking hands with a player who was trash talking him. So I frankly don't have any earthly idea where he came up with it. I think it's desperation and it's entirely spineless of him to attack the media who has not even attacked his players. Yeah. uh, The one thing that he did that a lot of coaches do is put the spotlight on themselves to take the pressure off the players. But if you're going to do that, you got to do that with some reality here. And Feinbaum's right. This is an alternative universe where he's saying that media is jealous of the players, so they are attacking them and using slander to do it. That's absolutely ridiculous. And Dion is too smart for this. He, he, he understands this better than anybody. Why? Because Dion was on TV for a long time. 
He was on the NFL Network. It was his job to talk about other players. Yeah, it wasn't college players. He was covering the NFL. But these are professionals also. And if if a, a media member criticizes either the behavior or the performance of a player, that's in bounds. And really, it always has been in bounds. It's, it's not, you know, all of a sudden, oh, wow, the players are making money. They make more money than I do, so I'm going to viciously attack them. That's not what happened here. And for Dion to, to basically throw a blanket over the media and say, all of you guys, that's, that's gutless too. Name names. Name some people who have slandered his players. Name them. Yeah, you can't do it. And look, you know, you, you put yourself out there. You, you, you put out a video of you telling the players, get out of here. You know, I'm bringing my own luggage and it's Louis Vuitton. Embarrassing them because their, their faces were on there. These, these are kids who had signed up to play college football. They'd been recruited by Colorado. Maybe it was another coach. But here's the new coach telling them to get out. Yeah, that's really that's really a good move. That that really is that a way to treat young men? You think that's okay too? You think that's all right, Dion? You know, I, I, I've admired what he's done with his career. Let's not mistake that. I mean, he is he has made himself into uh, well, in many ways an icon for 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 people who who want to do what he wants to do. But my God, I mean, what are you doing there? What 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 caused you to have that outburst like that? That was just absolutely ridiculous. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. Graham's coming up at 11 o'clock with, I'm sure, plenty of commander thoughts. We haven't heard much from them this week because the schedule was adjusted for Monday night football. So normally they get back on the practice field on Wednesday for a Sunday game. But because they're playing on Monday night, everything gets moved up. So Wednesday is now Thursday. They're practicing today, tomorrow and Saturday, and then would fly to Cincinnati on Sunday for the uh, Monday night kickoff. So Dan Quinn had an opportunity yesterday with uh, no practice and time to go on the Rich Eisen show. And uh, obviously, the number one topic of discussion was Jaden Daniels and the word that Quinn would use to describe him. The word that comes to mind is poise. Uh, In those moments, um, Jaden is really rock solid, man. So uh, tie game going into the last drive. And uh, he's got that smile. Let's go do a cube. And uh, so just confident, poised, ready to go. And so he really puts in the work, which I think gives him a lot of the confidence. Uh, and the other players definitely feel that from him um, as he's going kind of the he's growing. But the team is as well. Uh, we didn't have our best performance at Tampa. And so to see that improve week two, uh, we certainly expect that to keep going. But poise is, I think, one of the words that that comes to mind, Rich. Maybe when we had talked earlier, I spoke of his a good blend of confidence and humility. But now that we're in the games, uh, you see a really uh, calm, cool, collected guy that stays razor focused. How much do you talk to him about sliding, getting down? I mean, that moment when he had the wind knocked out of him, where he tries to split two defenders. It's like oh, I, it, I, I was like watching a horror movie, you know, like through through my fingers of my hand. What do you say to him? I'd say we are a work in progress on that part, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> um, it right. is a physical league, and so we want to make sure the smart decisions, when to get down, when to get out of bounds. And so um, just like every other part of his game, there's going to be some extended plays that he'll remain a passer and lets it rip down the field. And that – also kind of goes into some of the scrambles. And so I think you, we're going to work hard at that. He's been absolutely, you know, crushing all the things that, you know, we've thrown at him. And this is another one that uh, remaining a passer, you know, as long as you can, knowing there's some big plays out there that you can do that. And then when he has the chance to use his legs, get the yards, get down, and, and let's keep it moving. Yeah, I, and again, I've, I've never met him. Uh, I've only seen interviews with him, and I've only talked to people who know him. He, he strikes me as someone who should know better. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like he knows, right? He does. He does. He does. And uh, I think the things that you love about him um, are the same things. Like most things, there's like a blessing and a curse. Like he is a rare competitor. And so let's make sure uh, don't let the competitor override the decision making in that space because 
that part of him is absolutely fantastic in terms of the competitor. So for us, uh, making sure good decisions to go through it, and uh, and he'll improve on that spot for well, sure. He will. Yeah, that that is uh, that's going to be the big hold your breath every time they play uh, this season. We we saw it once last week where he took that hit. Uh, fortunately, only knocked the wind out of him. Came back after one play. Uh, when he says about the sliding, a work in progress. It's uh, a little different than the preseason. Remember when he played against the Jets and he uh, lowered his shoulder to pick up some extra yards and uh, Quinn made a joke about uh, double secret probation. It's, you know, he's, and, and he also mentions there about you know, how it's kind of double-edged. They don't want to necessarily take this away. And they talk about him extending plays and looking downfield. They still want him to do that. They want him to do a lot of that. But also he's going to pull up short on saying, hey, you know, he can't be running like that. The fan base is saying that. And, you know, maybe there's some uh, there's some leftover feelings from the way it ended for RG3. RG3, it, the, the, the sliding that he did, if he slid at all, is nothing like what Daniels does. I mean, Daniels at least gets down. I don't think, though, that's going to be sustainable for a long period of time, how to do this. And, you know, what they're hoping is that he's going to be more – comfortable in the pocket, uh, more, more able to look downfield. And, uh, and I, I even heard some film analysis, tape analysis yesterday that uh, McCaffrey was, was wide open on that play where he got hit, where, where uh, D- Daniels got knocked out of the game, that, that they could have found McCaffrey, he could have found McCaffrey down the field and didn't do it. And those are the kind of things that they have to look for. Those are the kind of things that, uh, that they have to improve on. Uh, this is part two of Quinn and uh, asked by Eisen about advice that Quinn got from other coaches who have developed young quarterbacks and who he leaned on. I definitely, um, you know, talked to Coach Carroll, you know, through that, you know, going with Russ on an early space. Um, I've had, certainly had conversations with Mike McDaniel and, and Adam has done um, some with his time um, in San Francisco. So um, he was very deliberate about pieces around the quarterback as a young player. So uh, for us, the interior part of the offensive line, why we had Zach Ertz, you know, the running game, all the things that go to support a player. I thought um, Adam just nailed every bit of that, Rich, to say let's make sure the running game, a tight end, um, you know, the interior part of the offensive line to make sure, you know, the person was protected in, in that way. And so those are a few of the things before the player you know, was even here that we selected. Um, we knew Jaden was the player that we wanted to take, but I thought Adam was very intentional about surrounding um, pieces around that player to make sure they would be set up for success when that time came, uh, you know, including signing a backup like Marcus Mariota to ensure that we were not going to be forced into something uh, before a ball player was ready. And I thought that was great intentional uh, mindset by Adam, and I couldn't agree with him more on that. I love that you mentioned Coach Carroll because I just remember how you know Seattle had signed Matt Flynn, right, Correct. and 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 drafted Russ and Carroll's all you know always compete mantra was personified by Russ's ascension and taking over that that job. Obviously, Jaden Daniels' path to the league is different, but are, are there any similarities? Do you think between the two of these guys? You know what the similarities were? Um, and I wasn't there on that first lap with Russ on his right. very first year. But talking to Pete, um, the similarities were that you gave them some benchmarks and they competed to go get it. You gave them some more and they went after it again. And so that's what I felt from Jaden from starting here, going through the offseason program, into training camp. And so um, it was a lot of topics about, you know, why aren't you naming him the starter already? It's like, and we're going to go through the process that we laid out. And I have full confidence that he'll get there, but let's go through the whole process. So 10 years from now, when the another player comes in at another position and why aren't you name him and starter? Let's say it's a receiver or, a, you know, whatever position could be any position. Mm-hmm. Like if Jaden Daniels went through it to go earn it, you can too. And I just think it's a fair way to go and allows the player to grow and you get to test him to see where he's at. And I think that's important um, in our league, Rich, to make sure if you're going into a locker room, a veteran player wants to know, can this guy help us win? And earning it, improving it, um, there's nothing better than that to establish that trust from the locker room. And I think that was a good way to go. Caleb Williams was named the starter for the Bears on the first day of rookie minicamp. 
And Williams is is struggling. He's shown some signs that he's going to be great, but he is not uh, not lighting it up yet for the Bears. And after they lost to Houston on Sunday night, uh, C.J. Stroud came up to him after the game for advice to give him some advice, and Caleb Williams wasn't interested in taking it. Um, so you know we're already seeing a little bit of a contrast between the two. While Daniels was fully accepting of of trying to earn the job and doing it. Um, it's a little bit different with uh, what's happening in Chicago. Five years from now, it may not mean a damn thing. But right now, it's just one more thing as we uh, watch the development of a young quarterback. As for Monday night, uh, you got Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals at home. And now this will be the big road test uh, in prime time, the first prime time game for Jaden Daniels. And uh, more importantly, uh, for Quinn and a defense which has not looked good at all, defense has not looked good. Uh, how he can get that on track facing a franchise quarterback who's taken a team to a Super Bowl. What we're looking for first off uh, is real play speed, Rich, to make sure that the attitude and the style is right. And the guys will continue to improve, but that is always a number one top of the pile, the effort, the relentless nature that you have to play with to play excellent defense. So the things I'd love to see us improve on are our tackling and our third down. We're not anywhere near the mark that we're going to be yet at that. But uh, to play well at Cincinnati, those are going to be two things that we're going to have to improve upon, our tackling and playing better on third down uh, to give ourselves an excellent chance to go play our best. So, yeah, I guess it's a it's a battle of the LSU quarterbacks, right? Coming up on Monday yeah. night. Yeah, actually, yes. I'm, I'm coming up with my, th- my, my storylines. Thank you for helping yeah. me with my homework here. So, but yeah, what, think- what, what, what do you see on, on tape? when you when you're taking on burrow like what's your concern here coach yeah i think um one uh man is the accuracy rich that you see um he can put the ball in the right location against the right coverage at the right time so that for me is always one you know from a quarterback standpoint he can process so quickly and then the other thing that i uh really respect about joe uh this guy is tough as nails and uh absolutely a, a rare competitor in our league um gets hit stays in there delivers the ball uh knowing that you know a hit's about to come down so the ones that consistently do that over and over again man you got to tip your hat to them and uh, joe is certainly that player all right joe burrow also yesterday on the eisen show and uh, his team surprisingly oh, maybe not surprisingly though the opener was a surprise uh, and then they lost a close game in kansas city over the weekend but they are zero and two you know a team that you would assume would be in the playoffs or an 0-2 team with one of the highest paid players in the league in Burrow, uh, but also not surprisingly, Burrow not concerned about the start when he talked to Eisen yesterday. One bad, one pretty good, but not good enough. So we're getting better every day. Working to improve. There's always room to improve after uh, losses like that and wins. So we're in a good spot. We're happy with how practice is going. We're getting better, so uh, we're excited for the opportunity on Monday. And in terms of the 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 self scout, how how are you self scouting yourself through the first two games of the season? Jim. One bad, one pretty good, but not good enough. Just about yeah. the same as our team. Uh, you know, I'm holding myself to a high standard, and I would say I've hit it at times, and I haven't hit it at times. So we're trying to improve every day, be more consistent. Uh, and hopefully we'll we'll get to where we want to by the end of the year. And then of course the uh, the question I'm sure you've heard from m- multiple people. I usually don't like asking those because I find myself unique, Joe. I'll be straight up. Um, you know the slow start. Can you put your finger on it? Why it keeps happening? Um, I think there's a different factors every year. I went to it for the third straight year. We're not panicking by any means. There's a lot of football to be played, but. Uh, lots of room to improve at the same time, just like any game every year. So uh, we're just looking to to improve every day, go out on Monday and, and have our best game yet, hopefully get a win and then move on. But you feel you feel good, right? Uh, all, all accounts are that you came into this season healthier and off of a more normal, for the lack of a better phrase, off season, training camp season, OTA season than maybe you've ever had as a professional. Yeah, I feel great. I feel good about where we're at too. We we played well on Sunday, just not well enough to win the game. We didn't make the plays down the stretch to to close it out. Uh, so we will on Monday. We're excited about the opportunity. I'm feeling good, feeling better every week. 
Uh, so we're going to continue to get better. So for you, how are you um, better than than even last year, even before you got hurt? How are you a different quarterback right now, Joe? Well, I think before I got hurt last year, I was playing my best ball. Uh, and so we're getting back. And it's always uh, – there's always an adjustment period when you're coming back from a season-ending injury. Uh, you haven't played football in a while. You know, you get the reps in training camp, but, you know, live bullets is a little different. Um, so I'm I'm really happy with how I improved from week one to week two. I'm looking to do that again week two to week three. You know, I'm confident in our scheme, confident in the game plan. So I'm just looking to improve every day. Uh, and if I do that, I'm going to – continue to get better now i know you're, you're you're known for your cool you know joe burr joe cool and what have you but do you beat yourself up mentally yeah of course i'm always looking for where i can get an edge where i where i can improve myself you know i expect to play close to perfect football and when i don't i'm pretty uh hard on myself and always looking for little areas to improve my game. And, you know, I would say Sunday was not perfect by any means. So that's always what I'm striving for. I'm striving for per perfection. And, you know, if you make little increments towards that goal, then, you know, that's a recipe for success. Well, who do you speak to when you beat yourself up? Just yourself? Who, who's in your myself. Seat? That's it? Yeah, I talk, I talk to myself. And, uh, you know, I'm definitely harder on myself than – than anybody else is around me. And I think that's how you you want to play the game and how you want to handle yourself for constant improvement. That's Joe Burrow on the Rich Eisen Show yesterday. Commanders will see him Monday night in Cincinnati, back on the practice field today.